the line of tight cast song. For the rest, it was just a noise, a clack, clack, clacking. And yet, though you could not actually hear what the man was saying, you could not be in any doubts about its general nature. He might be denouncing Goldstein and demanding sterner measures against thought criminals and saboteurs. He might be fulminating against the atrocities of the Eurasian army. He might be praising Big Brother or the heroes on the Malabar front. It made no difference. Whatever it was, you could be certain that every word of it was pure orthodoxy, pure insult. As he watched the eyeless face with the jaw moving rapidly up and down, Winston had a curious feeling that this was not a real human being, but some kind of dummy. It was not the man's brain that was speaking, it was his larynx. The stuff that was coming out of him consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness like the quacking of a duck. Simon had fallen silent for a moment, and with the handle of his spoon was tracing patterns in the puddle of stew. The voice from the other table quacked rapidly on, easily audible in spite of the surrounding din. There is a word in you speak, said Simon. I don't know whether you know it. Duck speak, to quack like a duck. It is one of those interesting words that have two contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, it is abuse. Applied to someone you agree with, it is praise. Unquestionably, sign will be vaporized, Winston thought. He thought it with a kind of sadness, although well knowing that sign despised him and slightly disliked him, and was fully capable of denouncing him as a thought criminal if he saw any reason for doing so. There was something subtly wrong with Simon. There was something that he liked. Discretion, aloofness, a sort of saving stupidity. He could not say that he was unorthodox. He believed in the principles of insult. He venerated Big Brother. He rejoiced over victories. He hated heretics. Not merely with sincerity, but with a sort of restless zeal, an up-to-dateness of information which the ordinary party member did not approach. Yet a faint air of disreputability almost clung to him. He said things that would have been better unsaid. He had read too many books. He frequented the Chestnut Tree Cafe, haunt of painters and musicians. There was no law, not even an unwritten law, against frequenting the Chestnut Tree Cafe, yet the place was somehow ill-owned. The old, discredited leaders of the party had been used to gather there before they were finally purged. Goldstein himself, it was said, had sometimes been seen there years and decades ago. Sime's fate was not difficult to foresee. And yet it was a fact that if Sime grasped, even for three seconds, the nature of his Winston's secret opinions, he would betray him instantly to the followers. So would anybody else, for that matter, but Sime more than most. Zeal was not enough. Orthodoxy was unconsciousness. Sime looked up. Here comes Parsons, he said. Something in the tone of his voice seemed to add, that bloody fool. Parsons, Winston's fellow tenant at Victory Mansions, was in fact threading his way across the room. A tubby, middle-sized man with fair hair and frog-like face. At 35, he was already putting on rolls of fat at neck and waistline, but his movements were brisk and boyish. His whole appearance was that of a little boy grown large, so much so that although he was wearing the regulation overalls, it was almost impossible not to think of him as being dressed in the blue shorts, gray shirt, and red neckerchief of the spines. In visualizing him, one always saw a picture of dimpled knees and sleeves rolled back from pudgy forearms. Parsons did, indeed, invariably revert to shorts when community hike or any other physical activity get an excuse for doing so. He greeted them both with a cheery, hello, hello, and sat down at the table, giving off an intense smell of sweat. Beads of moisture stood out all over his pink face. His powers of sweating were extraordinary. At the community center, you could always tell when he had been playing table tennis by the dampness of the background. Simon had produced a strip of paper on which there was a long column of words and was studying it with an ink pencil between his fingers. Look at him working away in the lunch hour, said Parsons, nudging Winston. Genius, eh? What's that you've got there, old boy? Something a bit too brainy for me, I expect. Smith, old boy, I'll tell you why I'm chasing you. It's that sub you forgot to give me. Which sub is that? said Winston, automatically feeding for money. About a quarter of one salary had to be earmarked for voluntary subscriptions, which were so numerous that it was difficult to keep track of them. For eight weeks, you know, the house by house fund. I'm treasurer for our block. We're making an all-out effort. Going to put on a tremendous show. 
I tell you, it won't be my fault if old Victory Mansions doesn't have the biggest outfit of flags in the whole street. Two dollars, you promised me. Winston found and handed over two priest in filthy notes, which Parsons entered in a small notebook in the neat handwriting of the illiterate. By the way, old man, he said, I hear that little beggar of mine let fly at you with his catapult yesterday. I gave him a good dressing down. In fact, I told him I'd take the catapult away if he does it again. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution, said Winston. No, well, what I mean to say shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Mischievous little beggars they are, both of them, but talk about keenness. All they think about is the spies and the war, of course. Do you know what that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop was on a hike out Burkhamsted Way? She got two other girls to go with her, slipped off from the hike, and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. He kept on his tail for two hours, right through the woods, and then when they got into ambush, he handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for? said Winston, somewhat taken aback. Parsons went on triumphantly. My kid made sure he was some kind of enemy agent. Might have been dropped by parachute, for instance. But here's the point, old boy. What do you think put her out of him in the first place? She spotted he was wearing a funny kind of shoes. Said she'd never seen anyone wearing shoes like that before. So the chances were he was a foreigner. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? What happened to the man? said Winston. Oh, that I couldn't say, of course, but I wouldn't be altogether surprised <clears throat> if Parsons made the motion of aiming a rifle and clicked his tongue for the explosion. Good, said Simon abstractedly, without looking up from the strip of paper. Of course, we can't afford to take chances, agreed Winston Duth. What I mean to say, there's a war, said Parsons. As though in confirmation of this, a trumpet call floated from the telescreen just above their heads. However, it was not the proclamation of a military victory this time, but merely an announcement from the Ministry of Plenty. Comrades, cried an eager, youthful voice. Attention, comrades, we have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over Oceania this morning, there were irrepressible, spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. Here are some of the completed figures. Foodstuffs and phrase, our new happy life, recurred several times. It had been a favorite of late with the Ministry of Plenty. Parsons, his attention caught by the trumpet call, sat listening with a sort of gaping solemnity, a sort of edified boredom. He could not follow the figures, but he was aware that they were in some way a cause for satisfaction. He had lugged out a huge and filthy pipe, which was already half full of charred tobacco. With the tobacco ration at 100 grams a week, it was seldom possible to fill a pipe up to the top. Winston was smoking a victory cigarette, which he held carefully horizontal. The new ration did not start until tomorrow, and he had only four cigarettes left. For the moment, he had shut his ears to the remoter noises and was listening to the stuff that streamed out of the telescreen. It appeared that there had even been demonstrations to thank Big Brother for raising the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. And only yesterday, he reflected, it had been announced that the ration was to be reduced to 20 grams a week. Was it possible that they could swallow that after only 24 hours? Yes, they swallowed. Parson swallowed it easily, with the stupidity of an animal. The eyeless creature at the other table swallowed it fanatically, passionately, with a furious desire to track down, denounce, and vaporize anyone who should suggest that last week the ration had been 30 grams. Sign two, in some more complex way involving doublethink, Sign swallowed. Was he then alone in the possession of a memory? The fabulous statistics continued to pour out of the telescreen. As compared with last year, there was more food, more clothes, more houses, more furniture, more cooking pots, more fuel, more ships, more helicopters, more books, more babies, more of everything except disease, crime, and insanity. Year by year and minute by minute, everybody and everything was whizzing rapidly upwards. As Simon had done earlier, Winston had taken up his spoon and was dabbling in the pale colored gravy that dribbled across the table, drawing a long streak of it out into a pattern. He meditated resentfully on the physical texture of life. Had it always been like this? Had food always tasted like this? He looked around the canteen. 
A low ceiling, the crowded room, its walls grimy from the contact of innumerable bodies. Battered metal tables and chairs placed so close together that you sat with elbows touching. Bent spoons, dented trays, coarse <coughs> mugs, all surfaces greasy, grime in every place. <coughs> and a sourish composite smell of bad gin and bad coffee and metallic stew and dirty clothes. Always in your stomach and in your skin, there was a sort of protest, a feeling that you had been cheated of something that you had a right to. It was true that he had no memories of anything lately different. In any time that he could accurately remember, there had never been quite enough to eat. One never had socks or underclothes that were not full of holes. Furniture had always been battered and rickety, rooms underheated, tube trains crowded, houses falling to pieces, bread dark-colored, tea or rarity, coffee filthy tasting, cigarettes insufficient, nothing cheap and plentiful except synthetic gin. And though, of course, it grew worse as one's body aged, was it not a sign that this was not the natural order of things if one's heart sickened at the discomfort and dirt and scarcity, the interminable winters, the stickiness of one's socks, the lifts that never worked, the cold water, the gritty soap, the cigarettes that came to pieces, the food with its strange, evil tastes? Why should one feel it to be intolerable unless one had some kind of ancestral memory that things had once been different? He looked round the canteen again. Nearly everyone was ugly, and would still have been ugly even if dressed otherwise than in the uniform blue overalls. On the far side of the room, sitting at a table alone, a small, curiously beetle-like man was drinking a cup of coffee, his little eyes darting suspicious glances from side to side. How easy it was, thought Winston, if you did not look about you, to believe that the physical type set up by the party is an ideal. Tall, muscular youths and deep-bosomed maidens, blonde-haired, vital, sunburnt, carefree, existed, and even predominant. Actually, so far as he could judge, the majority of people in Airstrip 1 were small, dark, and ill-favored. It was curious how that beetle-like type proliferated in the ministries. Little, dumpy men, growing stout very early in life, with short legs, swift, scuttling movements, and fat, inscrutable faces with very small eyes. It was the type that seemed to flourish best under the dominion of the party. The announcement from the Ministry of Plenty ended on another trumpet call and gave way to Timmy music. Parsons, stirred to vague enthusiasm by the bombardment of figures, took his pipe out of his mouth. The Ministry of Plenty certainly done a good job this year, he said with a knowing shake of his head. By the way, Smith, old boy, I suppose you haven't got any razor blades you can let me have? Not one. Said Winston. I've been using the same blade for six weeks myself. Ah, well, I uh, just thought I'd ask you, old boy. Sorry, said Winston. The quacking voice from the next table temporarily silenced during the ministry's announcement had started up again as loud as ever. For some reason, Winston suddenly found himself thinking of Mrs. Parsons, with her wispy hair and the dust and creases of her face. Within two years, those children will be denouncing her to the thought police. Mrs. Parsons would be vaporized. Sign would be vaporized. Winston would be vaporized. O'Brien would be vaporized. Parsons, on the other hand, would never be vaporized. The eyeless creature with the quacking voice would never be vaporized. The little beetle-like men who scuttled so nimbly through the labyrinthine corridors of ministries, they too would never be vaporized. And the girl with dark hair, the girl from the fiction department, she would never be vaporized either. It seemed to him that he knew instinctively who would survive and who would perish. And what it was that made for survival, it was not easy to say. At this moment, he was dragged out of his reverie with a violent jerk. The girl at the next table had turned partly round and was looking at him. It was the girl with dark hair. She was looking at him in a sidelong way. But with curious intensity, the instant that she caught his eye, she looked away again. The sweat started out on Winston's backbone. A horrible pang of terror went through him. It was gone almost at once, but it left a sort of nagging uneasiness behind. Why was she watching him? Why did she keep following him about? Unfortunately, he could not remember whether she had already been at the table when he arrived, or had come there afterwards. But yesterday, at any rate, during the two minutes' hate, she had sat immediately behind him when there was no apparent need to do so. Quite likely, her real object had been to listen to him and make sure whether he was shouting loudly enough. His earlier thought returned to her. 
probably she was not actually a member of the Thought Council. But then it was precisely the amateur spy who was the greatest danger of all. He did not know how long she had been looking at him, but perhaps for as much as five minutes. And it was possible that his features had not been perfectly under control. It was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away. A nervous tick, an unconscious look of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself, anything that carried with it the suggestion of abnormality, of having something to hide. In any case, to wear an improper expression on your face, to look incredulous when a victory was announced, for example, was itself a punishable offense. There was even a word for it in you speak. Face crime, it was called. The girl had turned her back on him. Perhaps, after all, she was not really following him about. Perhaps it was coincidence that she had sat so close to him two days ago. His cigarette had gone out and he laid it carefully on the edge of the table. He would finish smoking it after work if he could keep the tobacco in it. Quite likely, the person at the next table was a spy of the thought police. But quite likely, he would be in the cellars of the Ministry of Love within three days, but a cigarette end must not be wasted. Syme had folded up his strip of paper and stood it away in his pocket. Parsons had begun talking again. Did I ever tell you, old boy, he said, chuckling around the stem of his pipe, about the time when those two nippers of mine set fire to the old market woman's skirt because they saw her wrapping up sausages and a poster of BB? They sneaked up behind her and set fire to it with a box of matches. Burned her quite badly, I believe, little beggars, eh? But keen as mustard. That's first-rate training they give them in the spies nowadays, better than in my day, even. What do you think's the latest thing they've served them out with? Ear trumpets for listening through keyholes. My little girl brought one home the other night, tried it out on our sitting room door, and reckoned she could hear twice as much as with her ear to the hole. Of course, it's only a toy, mind you. Still, it gives them the right idea, huh? At this moment, the telescreen let out a piercing whistle. It was the signal to return to work. All three men sprang to their feet to join in the struggle around the lifts, and the remaining tobacco fell out of Winston's cigarette. Chapter 6 Winston was writing in his diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She was standing near a doorway on a wall under a street lamp that hardly gave any light. She had a young face painted very thick. It was really the paint that appealed to me, the whiteness of it, like a mask and the bright red lips. Party women never paint their faces. There was nobody else in the street. And no telescreens. She said two dollars. I, for the moment, it was too difficult to go on. He shut his eyes and pressed his fingers against them, trying to squeeze out the vision that kept recurring. He had an almost overwhelming temptation to shout a string of filthy words at the top of his voice, or to bang his head against the wall, to kick over the table and hurl the ink pot through the window, to do any violent or noisy or painful thing that might black out the memory that was still tormenting him. Your worst enemy, he reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate itself into some visible symptom. He thought of a man who he had passed in the street a few weeks back. A quite ordinary-looking man, a party member, aged 35 or 40, tallish and thin, carrying a briefcase. They were a few meters apart when the left side of the man's face was suddenly contorted by a sort of a spasm. It happened again just as they were passing one another. It was only a twitch, a quiver, rapid as the clicking of a camera shutter, but obviously habitual. He remembered thinking at the time, that poor devil is done for. And what was frightening was that the action was quite possibly unconscious. The most deadly danger of all was talking in your sleep. There was no way of guarding against that so far as he could see. He drew in his breath and went on writing. I went with her through the door and across a backyard into a basement kitchen. There was a bed against the wall and a lamp on the table turned down very low. She, his teeth were set on edge. He would have liked to spit. Simultaneously with the woman in the basement kitchen, he thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston was married. He had been married at any rate. Probably still was married, for so far as he knew his wife was not dead. He seemed to breathe again the warm, stuffy odor of the basement kitchen, an odor compounded of bugs and dirty clothes and villainous cheap scent, but nevertheless a lure, because no woman of the party ever used scent or could be imagined as doing so. 
Only the crows used scent. In his mind, the smell of it was inextricably mixed up with fornication. When he had gone with that woman, it had been his first lapse in two years or thereabouts. Consorting with prostitutes was forbidden, of course, but it was one of those rules that you could occasionally nerve yourself to break. It was dangerous, but it was not a life and death. Matter. To be caught with a prostitute might mean five years in a forced labor camp, not more, if you had committed no other offense. And it was easy enough, provided that you could avoid being caught in the act. The poorer quarters swarmed with women who were ready to sell themselves. Some could even be purchased for a bottle of gin, which the crows were not supposed to drink. Tacitly, the party was even inclined to encourage prostitution as an outlet for instincts which could not be altogether suppressed. Mere debauchery did not matter very much, so long as it was furtive and joyless, and only involved the women of a submerged and despised class. The unforgivable crime was promiscuity between party members. But though this was one of the crimes that the accused and the great purges invariably confessed to, it was difficult to imagine any such thing actually happening. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties which it might not be able to control. Its real, undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. Not love so much as eroticism was the enemy, inside marriage as well as outside. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose, and, though the principle was never clearly stated, permission was always refused if the couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The only recognized purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enemy. This, again, was never put into plain words, but in an indirect way, it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. There were even organizations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be begotten by artificial insemination, art sand, it was called in new speak, and brought up in public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted in with the general ideology of the party. The party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or if it could not be killed, then to distort it, dirty it. He did not know why this was so, but it seemed natural that it should be so. And so far as the women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine. It must be nine, ten, nearly eleven years since they had parted. He was curious how seldom he thought of her. For days at a time, he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. <laughs> they had only been together for about 15 months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight, with splendid movements. She had a bold, aquiline face, a face that one might have called noble until one discovered that there was as nearly as possible nothing between it. Very early in their married life, he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her, more intimately than he knew most people, that she had, without exception, the most stupid, vulgar, empty mind that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan, and there was no imbecility, absolutely none, that she was not capable of swallowing if the party handed it out to her. The human soundtrack he nicknamed her in his own mind. Yet he could have endured living with her if it had not been for just one thing, sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image. And what was strange was that even when she was clasping him against her, he had the feeling that she was simultaneously pushing him away with all her strength. The rigidity of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with shut eyes, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily embarrassing, and after a while, horrible. But even then, he could have borne living with her, if it had been agreed that they should remain silent. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. They must, she said, produce a child if they could. So the performance continued to happen once a week, quite regularly, whenever it was not impossible. She used even to remind him of it in the morning as something which had to be done that evening and which must not be forgotten. She had two names for it. One was making a baby, and the other was our duty to the party. Yes, she had actually used that phrase. Quite soon he grew to have a feeling of positive dread when the appointed day came round. But luckily no child appeared. 
and in the end she agreed to give up trying, and soon afterwards they parted. Winston sighed and nodded. He picked up his pen again and wrote. She threw herself down on the bed, and at once, without any kind of preliminary, in the most coarse, horrible way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt. I, he saw himself standing there in the dim lamplight with the smell of bugs and cheap scent in his nostrils, and in his heart a feeling of defeat and resentment, which even at that moment was mixed up with the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of the party. Why did it always have to be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own instead of these filthy scuffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was as deeply ingrained in them as party loyalty. By careful early conditioning, by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dinged into them at school and in the spies and in the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans, and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of them. His reason told him that there must be exceptions. But his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable as the party intended that they should be. And what he wanted, more even than to be loved, was to break down that wall of virtue, even if it were only once in his whole life. The sexual act, successfully performed, was rebellion. Desire was thought cruel. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down. He wrote, I turned up the lamp. When I saw her in the light, after the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. For the first time, he could see the woman properly. He had taken a step toward her and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out. For that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do, it had got to be written down, it had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair, but the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all. He wrote hurriedly in scrambling handwriting when he saw her in the light. She was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least, but I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last, but it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever. Chapter 7 If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in a prose. If there was hope, it must lie in the polls, because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together, or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary Brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice, at the most an occasional whisper word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it. And yet, he remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, women's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great, formidable cry of anger and despair, a deep, loud, ooh, that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he thought, a riot. The proles are breaking loose at last. When he had reached the spot, it was to see a mob of two or three hundred women crowding around the stalls of a street market, with faces as tragic as though they had been the doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment, the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans. 
They were wretched, flimsy things, but cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to make. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful women bumped and jostled by the rest were trying to make off with their saucepans, while dozens of others clamored round a stall, accusing the stallkeeper of favoritism and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of one another's hands. For a moment they were both tugging, and then the handle came off. Winston watched them disgustedly. And yet, just for a moment, what almost frightening power had sounded in that cry from only a few hundred throats? Why was it that they could never shout like that about anything that mattered? Until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the Poles from bondage. Before the revolution, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. They had been starved and flogged. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into the factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principles of Doublethink, the party taught that the proles were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjection, like animals, by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the proles. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire. They married at twenty, they were middle-aged at thirty, they died for the most part at sixty. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. This ends side one of cassette two. Please turn the cassette over and start side two from the same point. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous. But no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the proles should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism, which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty, specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of proles did not even have telescreens in their homes. Even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality in London, a whole world within a world of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers, and racketeers of every description. But since it all happened among the proles themselves, it was of no importance. In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the Pauls had shown any sign of needing or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. As the party slogan put it, Pauls and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose also. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably came back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out of the drawer a copy of a children's history textbook which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons and began copying a passage into the diary. In the old days, I mean, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you are had to work twelve hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But in among this terrible poverty there were just a few great, big, beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as thirty servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. 
They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces like the one in the picture on the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat, which was called a frock coat, and a queer, shiny hat shaped like a stovepipe, which was called a top hat. This was the uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all the houses, all the factories, and all the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw him into prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary person spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him and take off his cap and address him as sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the king, and... but he knew the rest of the cattle. There would be mention of the bishops in their lawn sleeves, the judges in their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat and nine tails, the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called the Jus Prime Noctis, which would probably not be mentioned in a textbook for children. It was the law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. How could you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were intolerable and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty, insecurity, but simply its bareness, its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, cadging a saccharine tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering. A world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons. A nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting, 300 million people all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, in patched up 19th century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, city of a million dustbins, and mixed up with it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with lined face and wispy hair, fiddling helplessly with a blocked waistband. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. Day and night, the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreations, that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of 50 years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that today 40% of adult proles were literate. Before the revolution, it was said the number had only been 15%. The party claimed that the infant mortality rate was now only 160 per thousand, whereas before the revolution it had been 300. And so it went on. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that literally every word in the history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been any such law as the Jus Prime Noctis, or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. Just once in his life, he had possessed, after the event, that was what kind of concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. He had held it between his fingers for as long as 30 seconds. In 1973, it must have been. At any rate, it was at about the time when he and Catherine had parted. But the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle 60s, the period of the great purges in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left except Big Brother himself. All the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and was hiding, no one knew where, and of the others, a few had simply disappeared, while the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials in which they had made confession of their crimes. 
Among the last survivors were three men named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965 that these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more so that one did not know whether they were alive or dead, and then had suddenly been brought forth to incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the enemy at that date, too. The enemy was Eurasia. Embezzlement of public funds, the murder of various trusted party members, intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother, which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing the death of hundreds of thousands of people. After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts, which were in fact sinecures, but which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analyzing the reasons for their defection and promising to make amends. Some time after their release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Cafe. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. They were men far older than himself, relics of the ancient world, almost the last great figures left over from the heroic early days of the party. The glamour of the underground struggle in the Civil War still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though already at that time facts and dates were growing blurry, that he had known their names earlier than he had known that of Big Brother. But also they were outlaws, enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the Thought Police ever escaped in the end. There were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to him. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighborhood of such people. They were sitting in silence before glasses of the gin flavored with cloves, which was the specialty of the cafe. Of the three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist, whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinion before and during the revolution. Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. It was simply an imitation of his earlier manner, and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. Always they were a rehashing of the ancient themes, slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists in top hats. Even on the barricades, the capitalists still seemed to cling to their top hats, an endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. He was a monstrous man, with a mane of greasy gray hair, his face pouched and seamed with protuberant lips, at one time, he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes, like a mountain crumbling. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. Winston could not now remember how he had come to be in the cafe at such a time. The place was almost empty. The tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner, almost motionless, never speaking. Uncommanded, the waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them with the pieces set out, but no game started. And then, for perhaps half a minute and all, something happened to the telescreens. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. There came into it, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked brain, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing, Under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. There lie they and here lie we, under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred. But when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed with a kind of inward shudder, and yet not knowing at what he shuddered, that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again with a whole string of new ones. They were executed, and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. About five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a wad of documents which had just flopped out of the pneumatic tube onto his desk when he came on a fragment of paper which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw its significance. 
It was a half page torn out of the Times of about ten years earlier. In the top half of the page, so that it included the date. And it contained a photograph of the delegates at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of the group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on that date, they had been on Eurasian soil. They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to a rendezvous somewhere in Siberia and had conferred with members of the Eurasian general staff to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had stuck in Winston's memory because it chanced to be midsummer day. But the whole story must be on record in countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion. The confessions were lies. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even at that time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys a geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms if in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. He had gone straight on working. As soon as he saw what the photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get as far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort. But you could not control the beating of your heart, and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by the fear that some accident, a sudden draft blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hole, along with some other waste papers. Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. That was ten, eleven years ago. Today, probably, he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having held it in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference, even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only memory. Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed? But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already, at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of Eurasia that the three dead men had betrayed their country. Since then, there had been other changes. Two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely, the confessions had been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer had the smallest significance. The past not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with the sense of nightmare was that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I do not understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time, it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes round the sun. Today, to believe that the past is unalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. He picked up the children's history book and looked at the portrait of Big Brother, which formed its frontispiece. The hypnotic eye gazed into his own. It was as though some huge force were pressing down upon you, something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you almost to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. 
And what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise of you, but that they might be right. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four? Or that the force of gravity works? Or that the past is unchangeable? If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? But no. His courage seemed suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by any obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew with more certainty than before that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien, to O'Brien. It was like an interminable letter which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its color from that fact. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against them. The ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate. The subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong and he was right. The obvious, the silly and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall toward the Earth's center. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. Chapter 8 From somewhere at the bottom of the passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily. For perhaps two seconds, he was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He had walked several kilometers over pavements, and his varicose also was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the community center, a rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the center were carefully checked. In principle, a party member had no spare time and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating, or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal recreations. To do anything that suggested a taste for solitude, even to go for a walk by himself, was only slightly dangerous. There was a word for it in you speak. Home life, it was called, meaning individualism and eccentricity. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the balminess of the April air had tempted him. The sky was a warmer blue than he had seen in that year. And suddenly the long, noisy evening at the center, the boring, exhausting games, the lectures, the creaking camaraderie, oiled by gin, had seemed intolerable. On impulse, he had turned away from the bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, first south, then east, then north again, losing himself along unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. If there is hope, he had written in the diary, it lies in the prose. The words kept coming back to him, a statement of a mystical truth and a palpable absurdity. He was somewhere in the vague, brown-colored slums to the north and east of what had once been St. Pancras Station. He was walking up a cobbled street of little two-story houses with battered doorways which gave straight onto the pavement and which were somehow curiously suggestive of rattles. There were puddles of filthy water here and there among the cobbles, in and out of the dark doorways and down narrow alleyways that branched off on either side, people swarmed in astonishing numbers, girls in full bloom with crudely lipstick mouths, and youths who chased the girls, and swollen, waddling women who showed you what the girls would be like in ten years' time, and old, bent creatures shuffling along on splayed feet, and ragged, barefooted children who played in puddles and then scattered at angry yells from their mothers. Perhaps a quarter of the windows in the street were broken and boarded up. Most of the people paid no attention to Winston. A few eyed him with a sort of guarded curiosity. Two monstrous women with brick-red forearms folded across their aprons were talking outside a doorway. 
Winston caught scraps of conversation as he approached. Yes, I says to her, that's all very well, I says. But if you'd been in my place, you'd have done the same as what I'd done. It's easy to criticize, I says, but you ain't got the same problems as what I got. Ah, says the other, that's just it. That's just where it is.